Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with me as we provide what we believe to be the final update of this triple murder from Saturday. I'm going to go down by the numbers and re recount what we released Saturday and then our updates now. And as, as you know, this investigation is not over. It's not complete. So the, anything that I say is subject to modification or change at a later date. Well, let me just show you the book in photograph. This is the photograph we showed you Saturday. This is this current photograph of Sean Runyon. He's 39 years of age. It's important to start out by telling you that this is a cold-blooded, calculated, violent, murdering beast. He planned in great detail how he was going to murder these three folks that we're going to talk about in just a minute. He was currently out on a $75,000 bond out of Pennsylvania. And listen to these charges that he's out of jail on in Pennsylvania. Strangulation, endangering the welfare of children, terroristic threats with intent to terrorize another, Reckless endangering of another, two counts. Simple assault, possession of marijuana, possession of drug paraphernalia, and harassment other than physical contact. This is all the violent charges he was out of jail on when he did this. So here's how this event all occurred. J&B Electric Company is out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. They were contracted to do works for Publix Corporation in Lakeland. Sean, along with the other electricians, was living or staying in a short-term rental in Windsor Resort up in Davenport. Friday morning about 2 a.m., apparently they're working overnight, Sean gets into an argument with his supervisor. Now let me stop there to tell you that I'm going to give you the names of the three victims because their family gave us permission to. The three victims were electricians, they were wonderful family people, just solid, solid folks. So it's Friday morning, they're at work at the construction site when apparently the supervisor, Kevin Lanzu, L-A-N-U-S-S-E-E, -E, got on to Sean and said he's not working fast enough. Sean punched him, hit him, and fled in the work truck. Now, Sean is the half-brother to the owner of the company. The owner of the company then told him, just come home. Sean went north on highway or Interstate 75 to Cordell, Georgia. Well, he heard an advertisement on the radio at the Broken Arrow Outfitters about a big sale they were having, so he pulled in. He pulled in to buy a crossbow so he could take this crossbow back to Florida and kill the three victims. That's right. He started on a Friday during the daytime to orchestrate this plan by buying a crossbow in Cordell, Georgia. Then instead of going on to Pennsylvania, where his half-brother and the owner thought he was, he turned around and he came back down 75, parked the company truck at the Tampa airport, and he rented a blue Nissan Versa. Well, what's important about that? Obviously, the company truck has logos all over it. And should he have used the company truck as a getaway vehicle, it wouldn't have been too hard to find it since it was a big white Ford F-450 with a name on the side and clearly indicative of a work truck for electric electricians. So he had to have him an inconspicuous vehicle. 
He leased this vehicle and then he went to a local Target store in Tampa where he bought a baseball bat. Now he's got a baseball bat and he's got a crossbow and he's put, putting his plan together. He comes back to the Polk County area and sleeps in the parking lot of a Walmart. We think it might have been just across the county line in the Claremont area. We're still running that down. He sleeps Friday night there, and so you see he's had a busy day. He was supposed to be working Friday morning. Two o'clock he has a fight. He gets in the truck. He goes to Cordell. He buys the crossbow. He drives back to Tampa on Friday rents a vehicle, and now is sleeping near the home of the victims. So why does he know where they are and their sleeping patterns? Because that's where he stayed. He knew what bedroom the victim slept in because that was where he stayed as well. So he gets up prior to 9.44 in the morning, which is when we received the 911 call. And he drives to the Windsor Resort and he parks two blocks away. He knows they're going to be in bed asleep because they've been working overnight. He knows their pattern. He's now deciding, I got a baseball bat, I got a crossbow, and as he's planning, he decides, ah, the crossbow may be more cumbersome, so he just takes the baseball bat. He goes into the back of the house, go in, enters through the back of the residence. His intent, as he told us in his confession, was to kill all three victims. He first went into Kevin Lanusi's bedroom, the supervisor, who was on the bottom floor. It's a two-bedroom home. And he said, I went in there. Kevin was asleep. And thank God, Kevin never knew what hit him. He immediately, his quote, I went to town on his face with a baseball bat. Kevin never woke up. Kevin was hit so hard and so many times that thank God he wasn't aware of what was occurring to him. He said, when I was confident that he was dead, and by the way, he wasn't. He is the one that survived for a few hours at the hospital, but he was unconscious, obviously, the entire time. The only reason he made it to the hospital was great paramedics because he coded on the way to the hospital and they were able to, to get a heartbeat back. So then he goes upstairs to the second victim's bedroom Second victim is Dulan Donnell. They knew him as Du from Baltimore, Maryland. He was asleep in bed, covered up. And he said, I beat Du in the head until I was confident that he was done. And then he went in the bedroom of the third victim, and this is all by his statements to us of Greg Dalzell, D-O-L-E-Z-A-L, who's from Akron, Ohio. He said, and I closed the door and that must have woke Greg up because Greg fought with him. And they, he said, I, I started hitting him, with a, hitting him with a bat. Greg fought back, so I took my knife out and started stabbing him. And he repeatedly stabbed him. They fought upstairs. And then Greg was able to come downstairs onto the front porch where he collapsed and died. There was a fourth victim who survived. He was struck in the back and the shoulder area of, but he was struck one time. The suspect, Sean, continued to focus on the three people. He never said he wanted to kill the fourth one, but he hit him, I guess, for good measure while he was there. Our suspect then fled 
from the residence back to his vehicle and ended up on an obscure street in Lake Wells, Florida, talking to an obscure person. Well, we've sorted that out. This obscure person is a public's employee who we're not going to release his identity. And he's, the public's employee got to meet him while he was on the construction site, and he was going to do some tile work for this public's employee. He knew where he lived, and that's how he showed up at his house in Lake Wells. He had blood on him. So the public's employee said, what happened? He said, well, I was in a fight. And he says, and I was raped. And the public's employee gave him a cloth to help clean up and then said, you need to go to the hospital. And he did. Thank goodness we have this absolutely wonderful community we live in who understand the community must help. And our person from Lake Wells immediately called, the share, called 911 to express what occurred and said, I sent the guy to the hospital. Well, the guy went to the hospital, went to Lake Wells Hospital. And that's where we arrested him and took him into custody. He confessed to us multiple times through the day. He told us he was raped, that those three guys did a train on him. And he hated all three of them. Well, we gave him sexual battery test. And I want to underscore that there is absolutely, unequivocally, zero evidence to confirm what our just outrageous, violent beast of a human being did. What we saw was three electricians, three family men, three folks that were here working and doing a really good job so that they could support their family and their children. What we saw here was three victims, three men, three electricians, with children. Two, at least two of the three had children. Do had a little girl as young as four years of age. We also know that Kevin had children as well, and they're gone. They don't get to see their children grow up. Do will never have a chance to walk his daughter down the aisle when she gets married or see his grandchildren. The little four-year-old girl will have to grow up without a dad. These were good people who traveled across the country to do work, and they were met by this evil, evil person. So at the end of the day, the case is solved. He's in jail. I understand people have a right to bail, but it does occur to me if he'd still been locked up for his May arrest in Pennsylvania, we would have these fathers, these good men, alive and working and with their family today. I told you about other victims. There was also a seven-year-old in the house at the time this occurred with her father, who's another one of our witnesses, and his wife. None of them were physically injured. So there were a total of seven in the house when the attack began. His three targets were viciously murdered. They were the focus. That's who he went after. Instead of having time to calm down from his rage when the supervisor chastised him, he only got worse over the next 24 hours to when he actually 
executed his homicidal plan about 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Are there any questions? Obviously, you had an anger management problem. We saw violent acts against his family, people that were very special to him back in May or allegedly special to him. And we see that he not only fought with and hit his supervisor on the job, but then when the boss, who, by the way, is his half-brother, says, come home, he makes it to Cordell when he goes, ha, ah, they're having a sell here at the Outfielders. That's where I'll get my crossbow to go back and murder them. He planned to murder them the entire time after he left. And I know you said that um, he gave his, he confessed several times. Can you just describe one more time his demeanor He was totally cooperative. He clearly, clearly, by his own admission, had used cocaine and marijuana in the past. He said he was of clear mind when this event occurred. However, we have evidence to indicate to us that he had cocaine and marijuana in his system. He was in a rampage. Three or more people are considered a mass murder. He had a pre-designed plan to viciously murder these folks. He had plenty of time to so change his mind, sleep it off, slip it off and do it anyway. Yes, sir. He had plenty of time to change his mind. Instead, he spent all of that time preparing his plan. What we believe he was going to do is commit the murder, escape, take the rental car back, get in his vehicle, and go, I was on my way to Pennsylvania. I don't know what happened back there. Like, that would be hard to figure out. Yes, because he had met this Publix employee at the job site and had agreed to do some tile work in his home. So that's why I think he's, you know, on drugs then. I mean, he shows up on Saturday morning unexpected, bloody. He knew where he lived because he was going to do tile work for him, and that's when... The public's employee says, whoa. Oh, and he said that when he said he was raped, he said, they won't do that again. That's as close as he got to a confession to that witness. But at the end of the day, this is bizarre. And my heart goes out to, to the victims. You know, Murdering someone is never, ever acceptable. But when you viciously attack three people who were in bed sleeping with a baseball bat, and there is home video, and we can see the obvious bend of the bat where he hit them that hard. at least two of the three victims never knew. They were hit that hard initially and in repetition that many times. But our third victim fought. He fought for his life. And when he couldn't get the best of our third victim with a baseball bat, he pulled a knife out and started stabbing him and stabbed him and cut him to death. It not only makes me angry, it makes this community angry. 
and it makes us angry on all fronts, not just the cold calculated murder, but leaving those children and those families without their loved one who simply was halfway across the country away from their family working to make a living for them. Something that we all get up and go to work every day to take care of our family. That's what they were doing. And on Saturday morning, after working at night, he knew they would be vulnerable. He knew they would be asleep. He knew he could take out this vicious attack without opposition because they would be sleeping. And that's what he did. No, he didn't, other than, uh, other than this fictitious rape story of his, which was his excuse, but you know and I know that, that just is not correct. Do we know how long they were here before this happened? No, I don't know how long they've been working on the job here, but we do know he, as recently as May, had been arrested up north. Okay? Thank you all very much. That should be, like I said, our last update. If there's, if there's any modifications of information, we'll get it to you. Obviously, as my predicate that I say every time, we're not complete, we haven't finished this investigation, but as my policy is to keep the community and you briefed on where we are, so if any of this is subject to change, then we can let you know that later. Or if it does change, it's all subject to change because the investigation's not complete. Thanks so much.